One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the 99% and become a one percenter. What's up, everybody? It's your host, Sam Bakhtiar with the One Percenter Podcast. I got my man, Cody Stevens, in the house. What's, What's up, up, Cody? Man? How's it going, brother? Man, thank you for coming to the house, brother. Hey, I appreciate you having me, man. Man, this has been a long time in the making, man. We've been talking, we've been friends, we've been communicating through social media. Brother, I've told you before, off camera, a billion times, man, I have so much respect for you because you are a 25-year-old, self-made, multi-millionaire, you know, with several businesses, including you own some self-made training facilities. You actually have one that you're in a talks to opening more of those. Right. And you own Capital Mortgage with three locations, mm-hmm. three offices, and six more coming in the next six to eight months. Right. I cannot believe somebody at the age of 20, because you know, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. I was a dumbass when I was 25. I mean, you look at me right now, you think, oh, I'm so successful. I didn't even fucking grow up till I was like 32. So when I see someone as young as you, you know, have so much discipline, not only in business, but also in life. You know, I was, I was watching one of your videos the other day. You were talking about people sleeping around and all that kind of stuff. Because in 25, that's the fuck what I was doing. Right. In 25, I was banging everything that was come close to me. You know what I mean? I was drinking. I was going out there just doing dumb shit that 25-year-olds do. But you were, tw- I mean, I just want to know, tell me, you know, what is the secret? How did you grow up so fast? Because you act like you're 45, but you're 25. You have a discipline of a 45-year-old. How did that, that come by? Man? I mean, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, man. You know, I, I, I was very blessed to have a, a, really great, um, a really great childhood, but my childhood was, was much different than most people's. And uh, uh, when I was really young, my mom, was, uh, my mom left my real father when I was, I was under a year old. And I had the blessing of being able to meet my, who became my father. I call him my surrogate father. His name was Leo. He lived here in Norco, California, and, um, and I was able to meet him when I was about a year old. Okay. And for the next 16 years, he raised me as his son. Um, it was kind of an interesting story. That's such a noble thing to do, for, for somebody to, be, to take another, chi- another person's child and raise them as their own. That's such a noble thing to yeah. do. Not many people can do that. It was wild, man, because I think, you know, I look at my life and I look at what I've been able to accomplish and I look at some of the hardships that I've gone through that have kind of molded me to have the mentality that I do. And it, it you know, 95% of it was because of my father. And um, we had, my, my dad and I had a really bad falling out when I was 16 years old, but for, for the 16 years that he was my dad, uh, he, you know, everything he taught me. So, I mean, so tell me, I, I, let, I, give me details. Yeah. I so, want to know details. So, you know, you were one year or younger, yeah. you know, he took you as, in, as, your, as his own son. What did he teach you? Tell me some stories, tell me some nuggets. Yeah, you know? so my dad was a horse trainer. Um, and it's funny because uh, anybody who hears me talk, I always use analogies a lot about animals and how, how to train an animal and how that can reference and apply to humans and everything. And it's, it's interesting because my dad, my dad was a horse trainer, but he, one thing I remember my dad telling me throughout my, throughout my childhood was, he said, Cody, if you ever have to explain why you tell somebody no, then you didn't set a good enough expectation. Mm-hmm. And it was something that always stuck with me because my dad never raised his voice. I think I heard my dad raise his voice one time my entire childhood. He never hit me, never spanked me. He, it, the discipline wasn't a traditional parent. The way my dad disciplined me was he made me feel disappointed. And it was like, it, and he did it with his eyes. Like, 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 t- like tell, me, tell me an example. Like, so for example, uh, you know, when I was 10 or 11, my dad would say, hey, you know, I need you to go take out the trash cans, you know? And it was, it was things as simple as this. Uh, he'd say, hey, Cody, I need you to take out the trash cans. And I'd say, okay, I was in the middle of playing a video game or something. And he would, you know, and, uh, and I'd say, okay, you know, I'll do it later. Well, you know, two hours later, I would get up to go take out the trash cans and they were already taken out. And he wouldn't say anything to me. He wouldn't come in and be like, you know, you didn't take out the trash cans. He wouldn't yell at me. He wouldn't scold me. It was when I would go to him and say, hey, dad, why did you take out the trash cans? He would just look at me and say, like, I didn't ask you to do it later. I asked you to do it now. Right. I mean, I, I feel I feel him. I feel yeah. him, man. I feel and, him. But it was like that tone of voice that it was like, 
it irked me inside. Like it made me realize that, you know, damn, I could have taken 25 seconds out of my day, press pause, pause yeah. and taken out the trash cans. And it was like, it was things like that. But I think, you know, the big thing was I grew up super old school, right? My dad was born in 1931. So he was in his 60s and 70s when I was growing up. And it was little things. Like I started to drive when I was nine years old, <laughs> you know, um, and all the cops in town knew us and stuff. And he would, you know, I'd be like, dad, like, what if we get caught? And he would be like, Cody, I was driving by the time I was seven, you know? So it was like old school mentality of like, stop allowing beliefs that society creates to limit old what you do. Old school mentality, old school, you know, you know, uh, work ethics, right. right. you know, and everything, you know, so, you know, he taught you so much discipline, yeah. you know, work ethics. Tell me why, why'd you have a fallout when you were 16? Because it looks like, I mean, it looks like it was a match made in heaven. Whenever I talk to you, um, you have nothing but great stuff to yeah. say about him. And that was like your, even though he wasn't by your biological dad, he was your dad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So tell me what really happened, you know, that at 16 that you guys had a big fallout. Yeah. My dad was one of those guys that when he said something, uh, you knew it was in stone. Like he didn't have to say things he was twice. A, he was an alpha male, right? Yeah. An alpha male, right? And, and it was... Uh, he followed through with what he said he was going to do, whether it was good or bad. And um, people knew that about my dad. And uh, when I was 16 years old, I was um, I was hanging out with a buddy of mine. And in high school, I, dude, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I, I was like, if you could think of an all-American kid, that was me. But I was also popular. So I was hanging out with the jocks and I was playing, you know, I was on varsity and stuff as a, as a freshman and sophomore. And and I was, I was doing all the right things that I could possibly do. I was hanging out with a buddy of mine. It was actually the night uh, Floyd Mayweather was fighting uh, back in 2009, I believe. Which fight? Which fight? Was it Oscar? No, it wasn't Oscar. It was, uh, I forget. I remember. I forget. Because I, I watched all his fights, yeah. man. I think it was 2009 he, he was fighting. I forget who he was fighting. Okay. Another big name. Uh, but anyways, he was fighting that night. We ended up going out to a friend's house. We were hanging out. No drinking involved, nothing. Um, and I had, I was taking the car. And so I told my dad, I said, Hey, do you mind if I just stay at my buddy's house tonight? Uh, I'm not going to be drinking or anything, but you know, we're probably gonna be out late. And I never had a curfew or anything. My dad never, you know, said, Hey, you got to be home by this yeah. time or whatever. But before I left, there was a really weird vibe in the air. And, and I can't really explain it, but it was one of those things that my dad didn't trust what I was doing. Like he thought I was lying to him or something. Mm -hmm. And so he had said to me, he said, are you sure you're going to your buddy's house? And I said, yeah, dad, I'm going to my buddy's. Like, and he know, you know, he knew all my friends or whatever. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what you're dealing with. So I left. About two minutes later, I realized I, was, I got down to the end of the street and I realized, oh, shoot, I, I forgot my buddy's sunglasses. He had asked me to bring them. So I turned around, went back to the house, grabbed the sunglasses, walked out the door. And my dad came out the door and he was like, why'd you come back? I said, I, I just forgot something I need to, you know, I need to grab. And it was weird because a, a switch flipped. I told you, like, I, I heard my dad raise his voice maybe one time in my entire life. And this was that time. It was like, he, he started yelling at me and whatever. So I just rolled up the window and left because I was like, dude, I don't know what you're yelling at me about. Um, long story short, ended up going that night, had a good time, whatever. Again, I wasn't drinking. So I decided I'm going to go home. I just want to sleep in my own bed. Um, I got home about 1130. Well, my dad had had, he was an older guy, right? So uh, he, he was always a little bit weary of obviously, if, you know, if somebody broke in the house or something, he had to be able to protect himself. Um, so he had always asked me, he said, hey, if you come home late and if I'm asleep, don't worry about it. But if I'm awake, just at, le at least let me know it's you so that I don't have to worry. I said, okay, no big deal. If I walked in, I could tell my dad was asleep. So I just went and went to bed. That night, he came in, knocked on the door about an hour after I got home and, you know, asked me, he said, why'd you get, why'd you come, why'd you come home? And I said, I just want to come home, dad. Like, I, no big deal. Like, I just yeah. want to come home. So he said, okay, uh, Monday morning, uh, I need those keys to be on my desk. Uh, you can figure out another way to get to school and um, whatever. I, so I wasn't going to argue with him at midnight. I was like, whatever, dad, no big deal. So I take the car out for the weekend. He acts like nothing's going on. Monday morning, I didn't I didn't put the keys on his desk. I went to school. Oh shit! And I I can already tell shit yeah. is about to hit the fan now, boy. So at uh, my my seventh period at school got out at two thirty eight, 
And I remember that because I got a call at 237. And I remember sitting in class and I saw him call and my heart like dropped into my stomach because I was like, oh shit. Yeah, I gotta face this now. So I get a voicemail from my dad and all he said was in this very tone of voice, he said, my expectation is that that car is in the driveway by 3 p.m. Well, you know how getting out of school is, there's traffic and all this stuff. So I run out of class, grab my girlfriend who's standing in the quad and I said, get your ass in the car, we gotta go. And so we, we start driving home we're going to make it on time. No big deal. It was, and, and just so you kind of understand where my mind is right now is I just get it. Like when my dad said, yeah. do something, you got to do it. Yeah. You be there. Yeah. So we're driving down the street and I actually stopped. Um, I don't know what it was, but I had a really gut feeling, intuitive feeling. I was like, something wrong is going to happen right now. And my dad and I had never had that relationship. It wasn't something where I needed to be afraid of him or anything like that. I mean, he's 75 years old. I'm yeah. flipping, you know, young kid, athletic. It wasn't like, but he's an old cowboy kind of guy. But, but he was. He, he was just. <laughs> he's an old, I tell people I mean? all the time, like, you can think of my dad as a person. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Gran Torino, like. He's like, like Clint Eastwood. Clint, kind of, yeah, I can yeah. see that. I'm imagining. That yeah. was exactly who I was imagining. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah, Clint Eastwood and Gran Torino is like an exact example of my dad. So, we, so we're driving down the street. I tell my girlfriend, I say, hey, I'm going to let you out at the corner. And she's like, what? I, and, you know, she's not understand what the hell. I'm like trust i don't know why i feel this way i would have got out of car i would have got out of the car myself and had her drive the <laughs> fucking car you know what i mean so, i'm just i'm just letting you know man you got to be smarter than that it's man. a trip man i'm gonna face it at that time but go ahead so i said all right cool so she's like she's like i'm not getting out of the car i said okay here's the condition then i said you walk in that house with me here's here's what you need to do i said you're gonna walk into my room you're gonna lock the door and you're gonna open the window and she's like why are you freaking out and i'm like I don't know, but I'm telling you something wrong is going to go, yeah. happen. So, what was your mom? My mom lived in Temecula at the time, okay. and uh, you know, uh, we'll so get into my so, mom. Okay, there, but, okay, yeah, okay. but she's uh, so, so so you so you stayed with with him. Yeah, I, okay, I, I lived with my dad most of the time because I went to school in North. Got Rome. it. Gotcha. So uh, so she walks. My we get in the driveway. Girlfriend goes directly in the room. I make sure she locks the door, everything, and I walk into the living room. And my dad, you know, my dad had always taught me uh, to never get over emotional, just ask questions, make sure you understand the reasons why things are going on so you can solve problems, right? So that's the way I walk into the room. I walk in the living room and I'm like, hey, dad, can we have a conversation real quick? And he's like, as soon as you give me the keys. I said, all right. So I tossed him the keys. He's sitting in a chair just like this. My dad was old school, right? So he sits in his chair all day long, you know, playing crosswords, eating Hershey Kisses whatever, just reading, you know, old man stuff. And so- uh, Shit, that makes me old, cause that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's sitting there just chilling. And so I toss him the keys and I'm standing in front of him. And uh, I said, okay, can we have a conversation now? Very calm, nothing. And uh, he said, there's nothing to talk about. And I said, well, dad, you're taking the car from me. You know, I got, I got football practice. I got all kinds of things going on. I need the car. Well, you know, you need to have some respect for me. I said, Dad, I don't know that I've ever shown you disrespect. And if I have, I didn't mean to. What can I do to make sure that you feel respected? And he said, you need to do what you say you're going to do. I said, OK, I'm not really sure where we're missing here. I realized quickly. So my dad had told me, he said, uh, or he was sitting in his chair and he said, Cody, I'm going to just tell you right now, you just need to shut your mouth and walk out of the room. And again, that was flabbergasting to me. I'm because like, you never had that before. We never had that relationship. So I'm like, what in the world? Like I'm stunned, right? So I was like, I'm like, Dad, really? He was beyond pissed that you didn't leave the car on that day. You right. took the car there. Gotcha. Right. I think that was what it was. Yeah. So, yeah. so he was he was pissed off, and and I said, I said, Dad, I said, really, you're gonna tell me to shut up right now? And so, ah. as soon as I said that, he started to get out of his chair. And my number one mindset was like, I am not gonna hit my dad. So he's 75 years old. Man. He's 75 years old, man. I'm not gonna hit my dad. I, so I started to walk out of the room. As soon as I took a step to go walk out of the room, he reached down from his chair, flipped over a book, and he had a nine millimeter pistol. And uh, 
I was I was probably standing by the corner of his chair at this point. So he just reached up. My dad was six four, so he had a big big reach, and he literally reached up, put the gun straight to my head, and I was facing walking out of the room. So I had a gun at the side of my head, and he just said, I mean, literally verbatim, he said, "I'll kill you and your mom uh, both before you guys can blink an eye." And my mom wasn't even there. I mean, it was just like, it was obviously this pent up resentment. Do you, do you think at that age he was starting? feel a little mentally out of it. You I, know, I, I can see I can see you're hurt. I can see like tears yeah, come from your eyes yeah. right now. And it kinda of hurts me as well. Yeah. That you know, you're trying to figure things out, right? And sometimes I feel like when people start getting certain age, certain traits become even worse. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it, it so was he's always an alpha male. You know, he's always the guy that, that you know, Grand Torino guy, yep. right? But now with age, probably got a little worse. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've tried to justify it several times, many different ways over the years. And, uh, you know, everybody that knew my dad knew he was a stubborn old man. But at the same time, I think, you know, he had a lot of friends. You know, he was in the Korean War. He, he had a lot of friends that had just passed away. You know, they were at that age where they were passing away. And I think, I think he got to a point where he was starting to feel like he was getting toward the end of his life. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, as, as I'm sitting there, you know, I'm, I'm standing there and I got a gun with the side of my head. You know, I tell people all the time, it's like, when people say your life passes before your eyes, when you're in a moment of potential death. You got a gun to your face, man. It's, it's, a, it's a different feeling. And it's not a feeling of like sadness or anger or fear. It's more of a feeling of instability. Like I was paralyzed, like I couldn't move. And, it was more because I realized my dad was at such an unstable mindset at that moment that I thought he would actually kill me. And so, it, and I mean, again, I just told yeah. you, my dad was somebody that when he said something, he did it. Yeah, he did it, yeah. So, he, I mean, he literally just told me like, I'm gonna kill you. And uh, so he ends up starting to cry. And what I, you know. He did? Yeah. And after pulling a gun on you, he, he just, he just took it down and started. No, playing. it was it was still it was still up. Still, he, was, hit. he was still pointing at me. He cocked the gun back and he started to cry. And immediately I realized he's becoming more unstable, which means there's more of a chance he's gonna pull that yeah, trigger. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm thinking through this stuff in my head. And I mean it, I I just remember I'm standing there and I'm thinking, my girlfriend's in the next room. What happens if he pulls that trigger? Does she run out? Does she get killed? Like I'm I'm thinking all this Bro, stuff through my time, head. at that time, man, at that time, I was like, boom, I'm trying to, I, I, yeah. you, know, you know, is that what you did? No. You know no, what I mean? Like, I, like, like I, at that time, like, it's just like fight or flight, right? I was paralyzed, bro. I stood there. You was like, you was just like a you know, deer in the headlight. You're like, ah, shit. I stood there and he said something that made me change. And he had said, uh, he had said, I don't have anything else to live for. And immediately I turned to him. Again, I got the gun to my side of my head. I turned to him. And so now I got the gun pointed at my face. And I said, you may not have anything to live for, but I do. And in that moment, he like hysterically started crying. And I literally just looked at him. And it was funny because in the, in the split second before that, I literally just started praying. I was like, God, I don't care what it is, but give me some kind of words to get out of this. And so I turned to him, I said, you know, I got something to live for. And he, uh, he immediately lowered the gun. I walked out of the room. Um, I hadn't started crying by this point. I was just emotionally stunned, right? Mm -hmm. So I walk to my bedroom where my girlfriend was and I knock on the door. Uh, she opens the door and I literally didn't say anything. I just started crying. And I didn't, didn't make a sound, it, tears just started streaming down my face. And she was like, what's wrong? And I literally said, let's go. And so we walked out the back door. Actually, before walking out of the back door, I had said to my dad, I yelled through the house. I said, hey dad, I'm letting you know, I'm gonna go ahead and walk to the gym. Cause I used to walk to the gym all the time. Like nothing happened. He goes, okay, see you when you get back. And it was like the most defeating feeling in the world. So we walked out in Norco, they, ha they have horse trails mm -hmm. uh, instead of sidewalks. So we were walking out, walk on the horse trail and I started walking. And the first thing I did was we get about, I would say about two, 300 yards from the house. 
And, and you start fucking running. No, didn't start running nothing. My, my girlfriend's asking me what happened. I can't freaking talk. I'm like freaking out. I call my mom. My mom had a really fucked up childhood. Like, if I, you know, it's one of those things like I need to write a book about her. Um, so I call my mom and I said, hey, before you make any decisions, you need to promise me you're not going to call the cops. Because my only thought process was at this point was if the cops show up at my dad's house, he's going to take his life. That was all I could think. And I didn't want him to kill himself. So I was like. I'm off of what I have a shootout with him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking, bro, I was thinking Grand Torino moment. Like, he's going to freaking pull a gun just to get him to kill him. Like, it, yeah. like, I couldn't. All I could get was, like, he's insanely emotional right now. Something bad is going to go wrong. So my mom goes, okay, uh, what's going on? I said, I need you to come pick me up at my buddy Lucas's house in an hour. I'm going to be over there. Um, and, you know. I said, I don't need you to ask any questions until I get in the car with you. She goes, okay. So call my buddy Lucas. He lived kind of down the street. I said, and he, had, he could tell immediately. I got on the phone. He could tell I had been crying. I said, I need you to pick me up on the corner of Sierra and Fifth. He said, I'll be there in five minutes. Didn't ask any questions. I, I, he pulled up. Me and my girlfriend both got in the truck. He literally didn't even ask me any questions for the entire day. I was that, that's a that's a good friend. That's a friend, man. That's I, a friend. I tell everybody that story, and I tell I I leave that part in the story yeah. just because I need people to understand. Like sometimes it's, you just need people to let people go through what they need to go through. Bro, you yeah. know, you know, you know, you know. You gotta, you know. I know sometimes I need my bitch moment. Yep. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I'm like, please give me my bitch moment. Yep. I need a bitch moment right now. Right. You know, like, well, what happened? What's going on? No, let me have my fucking moment. Right. And not too many people were to fucking pry what happened, fucking form an opinion and all that kind of shit. It's wild, I, man. I get, I, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah, man. So that was, that was the falling out we had. And, uh, uh, you know, for a few months after that, I never told anybody what happened. In fact, I didn't tell anybody what happened for years. Yeah, you, um, don't, you don't want that, man. I didn't want my dad to have a bad reputation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I was aware enough and I think I was mature enough just to understand that, hey, shit happens in life. Uh, it wasn't anything personal against me. It was just probably some insecurities he's got going. I always tell people this, man. When this shit happens within the family, it has to be contained within the family. Yeah. You know, and... Um, when other people gets involved, and other fucking people's opinion gets involved, I said, unless the relationship is one hundred fucking percent over, yeah, nothing should be said outside of it. It's so true, man. It's so true. I uh, my dad passed away in October of last year. In fact, that was the day I, you and I, I met. It's so funny. I was gonna bring that up. Yeah, man. And that's something I remember. Yeah, I remember meeting you, and you were, you were very distraught. Yeah. I remember, you know, to say, you know, you were gracious enough to still keep your word to meet me. You know, that which was a lot more than what most people could be able to do. And I remember you telling me, and I, and I remember like you, gosh, you had this shaky voice, you know, and I remember that day, you know, and, yeah. I, and I could see your the pain through your eyes and your body language. It was tough, man. I think uh, it was one of those moments like my dad and I didn't talk for 10 years. And, I, you know, I tried, to, I tried to reach out to him several times, but he, stubborn old man. And it was one of those things where there was an unspoken word that everything was good. Like, I, you know, I, I don't have any regrets. You know, I, it was one of those things like when he passed away, I think it was just like, I'm more glad that he's finally at peace. You know, you know, just, it's so sad, man. You know, cause I always look back and I look at it. I'm like, fuck, you know, every, you know, a lot of times we have beef and issues with people and over some stupid, dumb shit. Yeah. Right. Now, obviously, this wasn't no dumb shit. This was pretty fucking severe. Right. But how many times, you know, you had beef over some dumb shit? It's wild, you know what bro. I mean? Dumb shit. You know, I had, well, it's, I, like, I, it's like the video I posted this morning, man, on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, bro, there's like these tiny things. You don't even think about them, right? It's just these little tiny things that sometimes just hit you like a flipping atomic bomb and just make you realize, holy shit, man. Like, you get a chance every day to live the happiest life you possibly could. I had somebody, you know, you know, in a fight with me or something like that. Like, yo, you, you, why'd you unfollow her? Because I don't want to <laughs> fucking follow her. Right. You know, you right. Forgot to explain myself. Right. right. I don't have nothing personal about it. You know, I don't nothing personal. I just don't want to fucking follow her. Right. You want, you want to fight about it? Let's fight about it. Right. It's, it's, I mean, but people get into these dumb kind of shit and then they don't talk and then next thing you know, man, it's like you know, here's the here's the problem, man. You know, it's like looking back, I can, I can almost pretty much bet, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that 
there's a part of you that regret that you know you guys didn't have a relationship for ten years yeah. until you died. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it, if I if I could have had it the other way, yeah, you would have. Oh yeah, man. I mean, you know, I, I remember that, and day. I know him too. I mean, he was in his deathbed. Yeah, you know, did, did you know he was in his deathbed? Don't you think that he wanted you on on his side or yeah? I mean, on, on, you know, on a thing over 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 what you fucking took a car for a day? Yeah, you know, it really it really came down to one thing. Yeah. You said you want to leave the car, you know, for one fucking day. Right. Big fucking deal, yeah, right? Man. So you know, there there's so many other things to be mad about in life, and there's people out there, you know, homeless and fucking arms and leg cut off and got all kinds of terminal illnesses and and we're 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 fucking fighting over some bullshit. Yeah, man, I you know, I know I know this conversation's been somewhat deep, but it's like I I tell I tell people all the time, it's like I get these I don't know what it is, but I just you know, I think there's a, it, and and you know what I'm talking about here. There's like a difference between people that say they want to help people and they and then the people that actually truly give a shit. Like yeah. The people like, you know, I, I have you have those friends where you're like, I don't care if I was across the world. I could call this dude and he'd be there. I could call this person. You're one of them. You're one of them. I mean, Cody, I mean, look, man, you know, we don't know each other that well. You know, we met a few times and all that kind of stuff. But the little conversation that I had with you and, you know, been been around you, you know, we don't we don't we don't talk every day or every week or every month. Right. But I can bet like, you know, I can pick up the phone. Say, Cody, hey, I need no help here. This, I know you'll be there. Yeah. I think we have the same, you know, you know, you know the same about me. Those are the kind of friends I need. I don't need a girlfriend. Yeah. You know, I don't need a fucking wife. I need a fucking friend. Right. You know what I mean? I don't even want my wife fucking calling me ten times a day. Right. You know what I mean? I got shit to do. Right. I'm trying to get work done. Right. You know, when 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 a, when a friend becomes a fucking high menace, like a wife, man, I'm like fuck, man, we gotta go, man. You know what I mean? It's just that kind of relationship I want to have. True, man. You, you feel me? I think that was kind of the thing that you know as. You know, it kind of came back to like track is, you know, for the couple of years after that happened with my dad, we had, um, I had about a year and a half where I had a really unstable life. Like I was digging through trash cans. I was collecting bottles. I was doing anything I could possibly do just to make a buck. This is after you, after you separated from your dad? Yeah. You went, you went to stay with your mom? I, I went to stay with my mom for about two weeks. And part of the problem was my, so my girlfriend I was with at the time, we were actually together for, uh, for almost eight years growing up. And uh, she had a really rough family life. Um, so she was actually living with me at my dad's. And... Um, you know, I used to get shit for that for, for a lot of people, but you know, she needed, uh, she needed a really safe place to be. Mm -hmm. So she stayed with me at my dad's. And when obviously everything happened with my dad, I went and called my mom and said, Hey, you know, I'd like to, I, I, I need her to be able to move in with us. You know, she can stay in the room downstairs. Like, I don't need you to be okay with us being in the same room or whatever. I just need her to be in a safe place. And my mom wasn't cool with it. And I could understand why. So, uh, so I made a decision. I said that I'm going to go do my own thing. You know, and I was 16, and my, and I give kudos to my mom today because she allowed me to do it. Yeah. Um, so I slept many, many, many nights in my car. Um, uh, started my first business when I was 16. Hey, you had uh, to figure somewhere out, but you had oh. you you had a ball and chain. That's so it. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's so it, you dog. had to take you had to take your you had to take your bro, ball and chain too. Bro, you got to figure out when when people are dependent on you. Uh, that's a different level of desperation. Yep. I tell people all the time, like. You can't fucking think about success until you felt desperation. Yeah. Plain and simple. So true, man. Been there, done that, my friend. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that, was, that was a really, really iconic part of, of me growing and maturing. And it's funny because like, I've always gotten that. Like, dude, you flip and act like you're 30 years older than you are. And it's like, I know. You, you, but had, you had to mature up. You have to. You had to. You have when, to. You, when you had do or die at 16, yeah. you know, when you had a gun pulled to your head, when you, you know, you know, you know, you didn't have the best of situations and upbringing, right. you know, you kind of, you kind of build those mental scars yeah. and those things that, you know, you do, I gotta, I gotta grow up, you know, I gotta grow up. I don't have any other way. You know, I had to, you had to fiend for yourself. You had to protect yourself. You had to protect whoever you were with at the time, you know, and uh, that's what, that's what, and that's what made you who you are today. And right. so you, so a lot of times when I was growing up, Cody, you know, uh, you know, at the time, I was like, why is this, why this is happening to me? Why are we like this? Why are we like that? Not realizing that that's God's superpower. Yep. You know what I mean? Have I been, have I had an amazing dad, an amazing mom, right. you know, and, you know, a house like this, 
you know, growing up, maybe I wouldn't be as motivated or maybe I didn't have a fucking complex like I need to go fucking crush it every, you know, every day. You know, I get up because I have a complex. My biggest fucking fear is, you know, being fucking broke and not being able to provide for my girls and my, for my family, for my wife the way my, my dad didn't, you know, you know, you know, provide for me. Damn. You know, and so, th- so, so what, what was my biggest devastation became my, super, my, my, my biggest superpower. Amen to that, brother. I think the, it's, it, I tell people all the time, my biggest fear, my biggest fear in life is, is not being at peace. And it's funny because when, you know, when I get the question of like, you know, what do you feel about your dad or whatever, it's like, I love him. I don't have any, I have zero, zero bad feelings. You're here because of your dad, no matter what this is, you know what I'm you hear your work ethic, everything that you become, because it's all those things he taught you were on the way. We got you know, one, 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 you know, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. One bad incident, which as bad as it was, one bad incident cannot throw all the years of good that he's done. Right. You know what I mean? Well, and it's like, you know, dude, you think about, I mean, the way that I was raised and the, and the, way, and the things that he was, he was so good at certain things. And I mean, if you got, you know, if you follow me on social media, if you watch the way we run our businesses, if you do things, it's like, it's insanely reflective of those characteristics. And I mean, it's literally how I set my core values for my companies. It's, it's how I brand myself. Like, you know, um, you mentioned, you know, one of the videos I did last week about sleeping around. It's like, it's stupid shit like that, where people don't think those things are a big deal. It is a huge deal, bro. It's and a it's huge like, deal. Like, I, 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 when you were talking, when you were, when I heard you say that, it's something I, I thought about so many times, you know, and it, it's funny, man, you know, because, you know, when, when I didn't have that mentality on your age, if I did, Bro, if I was thinking the way you were thinking right now, I'll be a billionaire, not a millionaire. And I guarantee you, you're gonna be there. You're gonna you're gonna be a B. You know well, what I mean? part of my part of my part of my blessing is that I get to, and not to be cliche, but I get to spend my time in a circle with people like you and people that I've been able. The best I can tell you right now, I'm not smarter than anybody. I'm not more talented than anybody. The one thing I do really, really, really well is I implement. Yeah. And I just, I listen to people like you and I say, yo, Sam said to do this, I'm going to go do it. Yeah. And then as I get more skilled at it and I figure out what, what works and what doesn't, I put my little twist on it. Well, they say success follows speed, yeah. speed of implementation. Right. 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 Some people, you know, you get ready, aim, 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 aim for the right time, for the right place, for the right people. You know, that's just not going to happen. Sure. You know, you, you, you know, you, you shoot. And then you course correct along the way. Right. You know, most people go all through their life wait, waiting for the perfect moment and all that kind of stuff. And I always said speed of implementation is one of the key things to success because what does it do? Speed, speed of implementation just makes you fail faster. Right. And the faster you fail, the faster you closer you get, you closer you get, you closer you get. So let's talk about business right now. Yeah. You know, those are history. I love your fucking history, bro. I, I love the fact that nothing was handed to you, everything was handed, you've you done it through hard work, through perseverance through learning lessons, through pulling a gut out on you and, and threatening your life. You know, I, I love that. But let's talk about, you know, you, you know your business philosophy. Right. Right. Good. So for all the entrepreneurs out there that you see right now, you know, what are some of your you know, top two, top three advice for people who want to get into entrepreneurship, want to start their own business and want to, want to crush it right now in this economy? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say number one right now is, you know, we're in a world where, uh, you need to be the best version of you and you need to be, you need, it's not just about walking that in your business, it's about walking that in your life. Sure. You know, I think it's, it's funny because when I'm, I'm naturally a more reserved person, I kind of sit back, I don't, I don't like to be out in the forefront. Um, but one thing I realized quickly was like, dude, I have a lot of good shit to say. Yeah, you do. And, and like, do. And, and, I've, and I've had the blessing of being able to learn and be educated by some of the top people, not only in my industry, but top entrepreneurs in the country. Yeah. So I need to be able, part of my value is being able to give that back. Yeah. And if I'm, not, if I'm not taking an initial approach of being able to say, look, let me come help you, or let me be in a position of at least walking my talk yeah. on a consistent basis, dude, I'm, I'm no more valuable than the guy standing there that's not doing anything. Yeah. So the number one thing is just be the best version of you and, and be willing to be loud about it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not about showing off. You, it's about you, just being you. You said something very profound right now. You said, I won't be any different than somebody who's not doing shit, which is so true. Yeah. 
you're out there doing shit. 25 year old self-made multimillionaire, multiple businesses. Imagine if you just, you know, your natural reserve and you stayed reserved. You won't help anybody. Yeah. You won't help anybody. You, you could be like that guy who's drinking, you might as well be that guy who's drinking 40 ounce of malt liquor. Sorry, I'm from the hood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so malt liquor and fucking smoking weed all day, you know, and not doing shit, right? So, you know, so it, made to, it makes total sense. So it's kind of like our duty and obligation to the world to share our life experiences because no matter how much you know or who you know or whatnot, there are certain things that you have done that other people haven't done or are going through at the same time that you can help them. Yeah, and I think, you know, dude, it's so important to realize that, like, for example, and, and to touch on that a little bit, like, you know, I, I walk around with a certain posture, like, right? So I know who I am. I'm not the class clown. I'm not the jokester. I'm the dude that wakes up at 3 or 4 a.m. every single morning, motivated, inspired, ready to rock and roll with no extra effort. Yeah. I don't have to listen to a podcast. I don't have to watch Gary Vee. I don't have to do all that shit. I just wake up like this. Yeah. And part of that is I realized very quickly at a young age that that's my talent. It's not, I don't need to be the guy that, you know, that every single person on the planet likes. I need to be the guy that's super productive, super, super efficient, and a leader, right? And I think some people get caught up in this like, oh, well, I need to, I need to copy what this person's doing, or I need to be like this person. It's like, yeah, take the good from them, but be the I best version of you. Shit, man. You know, the other day, you know, somebody like I think messaged my wife and said, hey, this person is like a, you know, kind of celebrity entrepreneur in, mm -hmm. on the internet. I don't want to name no names, but I mean, I have a lot of respect for all of them. Right. You know, but just because I have respect for them, that doesn't mean everything they say is fucking gospel. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Well, just with, oh, everything they say is fucking gospel. I'm like, dude, last time I checked, the guy's not Jesus. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I get, you know, what this person said and that person and that person. I make my own opinion at the end of the day, how I want to live my life, how I want to be able to do it. But some of these people, man, it's literally taking like, that's the only way to fucking do things right. and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that, that's never been me. Man. And, and, you know, I talk about it all the time when people say motivation, motivation, motivation. I'm like, look, fucking did Sam Walton? have like motivation? Right. Did, you know, did Thomas Edison back then have fucking motivation? No, just have deep burning desire, you know, right in the gut. Yeah. To be like, they didn't have fucking Gary V, Grant Cardone's and Eric Thomas's and, and Tony Robbins back in the day, fucking rah, 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 right. rah, rah. And there's nothing wrong with it once in a while you want to do that, but all means not. But if you're somebody who needs rah, rah all the fucking time for you, then your why is not big enough. You know, you know, no. your why is not strong enough. You know, your, your reason is not big enough. The, the number one thing I think about, because you just made such, a, such an amazing point, is it like, right, we're, especially on like IG and all this shit, we're on this self-love craze. And it drives me nuts, to be honest, <laughs> because it's not like, look, the, the idea is good. Like, love yourself, yeah, make sure to pay attention, though, man. you know. But here's the thing. This is the mistake people make about self-love. They believe that by loving yourself, it has to take away from somebody else. Yeah. And that's not the case. Yeah. The idea of loving yourself, the most profound- So you can love other people more. Bro, that's the, the best analogy I've ever heard of this is when you get on a plane, what they do is they say, hey, look, if we ever reach a certain altitude where the oxygen level in the plane drops, there's going to be an oxygen mask that drops from, from the ceiling. At that point, Please place the oxygen mask over your own mouth before you try to help anybody else. Yeah. The point is, is if you die, you can't help anybody. <laughs> I always tell people, man, you know, you know, you can't help somebody from drowning if you can't swim. Bro, plain and simple. <laughs> plain like, and simple, man. You know. Uh, so it's like the point of loving yourself yeah. is so that you can be there for others. Is so that you can be a a trampoline. Is so that you can be a stepping stone for the success of others. If you can't share your shit with people, it ain't worth nothing. You know, we're both in the fitness industry. We both own some gyms, you know. And I see it all the time where, you know, either, you know, it's the parents, either mom or either dad, you know, they got some kids, life happened to them. You know, they had to go to work, you know, kids take care of the family. They kind of put themselves on the back burner. You know, they used to look good before and all that. And next thing you know, you know, 10, 15 years go by. Before you know it, it goes like this. Yep. They look in the mirror and now they can't even go up, with, you know, they can't even play with their kids or they can't even move or they feel bad or they feel self-conscious and nothing feels anymore. They, you know, 
none of the family get together because they want to go. They're not taking any pictures or they're not going to barbecues. And, and you know, that's not, what, that's not your highest self. That's not you, what, what you want for your family. You want to be vibrant. You want to be able to have energy. You want to be able to be outgoing. You want to be able to run around with your children. So to me, taking care of yourself is the most unselfish thing you can do because if you cannot take care of yourself, if you don't feel good, like, you, like we talked about, you can't, you can't be there for anyone else. Oh. And we see it in the gym all the time. You know that. You got to walk your talk, man. Yeah. In every part of life. I think, you know, the, one of the scariest things I think about, you know, I don't have kids, so I, I, can't, I can't first person talk about this subject. But I do believe, like, just from watching other people, that people use their kids and they use their family as an excuse to get stagnant. And they say, but but you gotta think to me, you gotta think. Like, if anything, if you really give a shit about your kids, this is one thing I tell people all the time, like, stop saying you can't because. Start saying you can because. Start saying you should because. Like, the moment you wake up in the morning and stop saying, oh, I gotta take my kids to school, and you start saying, I get to take my kids to school. Yeah. I, I have to go feed my dogs. No, I get to go feed my dogs. This is an opportunity, not yeah. a ple- and not a uh, not people, obligation. Some, some people can't get out of the couch, bro. You know what I mean? And this is the, that's the thing. It's like you're, you know, you you've been around it probably probably much longer than I have. But it's like, dude, I watch people, and like I know it sounds so cheesy, but I'll be driving down through my neighborhood, and I see somebody that's overweight just walking, and I'm like, I want to get out and clap. I'm yeah. like, fucking congratulations yeah. because you made the first step, yeah. like. I don't need you out there running a marathon. I just need you to do something. So, Cody, you know, I always thought about you about this, man. You know, so I'm looking at a 25-year-old self-made multimillionaire. You know, you just starting, not even hetero prime yet. You know, you're just on a forward trajectory, multiple businesses, good-looking guy, no homo, good-looking guy. You know what I mean? And so how do you deal with dating how do you deal with all that kind of stuff? Because I'm going to tell you right now, God knew me. That's why he didn't make me multimillionaire when I was 25. Because <laughs> I would have probably had 16 kids, you know, from 16 different women, you know, all right now. I'm just being, I'm just being yeah, straight up, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and thank God, you know, I, it wasn't until, you know, just a few years ago, so I hit it big. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't overnight. It was 17 years of overnight, but right. it was, you know, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I'm picturing young Sam, 25, multi-millionaire. And you have a fucking house in Vegas, don't you? Yeah. You have a house in Sin fucking city. And talk about that, man. Bro, it's tough because I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think growing up, and, and I know a lot of people grow up with single moms. Um, but I grew up with a single mom. And, you know, I think... I think that did a lot for me and my mentality yeah. of women. Um, I really give a shit about people. And I think the tough thing for me is I watch so many women uh, have a really shitty perception of men yeah. because of the way that men think. And I don't want to just be a leader in my business. I want to be a leader in my life. And I just don't think that's where God calls me to go. No, I, I, I get it's, it. Is I think, how do I deal with the temptation? How do I deal with the dating? How do I deal yeah, with all this that's shit? That's what I want to know, bro. To Talk be to honest, me about bro, that, Cody. we're in a world. We're in a world right now where I think it, it's a little bit scary, man. It like, is scary because it's because it's not like you know. Look, I can understand if you were going around and you know telling women what they wanted to hear and sleeping with them and then dumping them and all that kind of stuff, but now. Women are kind of aggressive these days. I'm, you know, Bro, like, I mean, like, I mean, it's I'm, a different you know, world, man. It's you know what I'm saying? World. So, so, you know, so, you know, just. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, man, because I've dated a few chicks, uh, you know, over the last year or two, and it's like, uh, I'm attracted, dude. I'm, I'm so attracted to like intelligence. Me? You know what? You know, I wish I was attracted to intelligence at 25. I wasn't attracted to, I wasn't attracted to butts and boobs. Yeah, That's what right. I was attracted to at 25, man. You know, I'm only to like three years ago, man. Like, you know, it was like, it was like, man, you got to have something, you know, now it's like some, you know, they talk about like entrepreneurship, about that, you know, you know, things. I'm like, ooh, yeah. ooh, tell me more. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? Like, like man. 
I just, dude, I want to hear about people's like, and I know it, it, it sounds so cliche, but it's like I fucking love when I get to hear about people's dreams. Yeah. Like, and it's not, it's just my passion. I think I've been that way my whole life. Is like I just, I really, really, really give a shit about watching people accomplish what they want to accomplish. And the one thing that I'm not gonna lie, it's one of my biggest turnoffs in life. Like, I'll be, I'll be out with a girl or something, and if she's like super, super eager to jump into bed with me or something, I get super turned off. Yeah, because, because guess what? Guess what? You ain't the only motherfucker. Shit exactly. That's I mean? my point. You man. ain't, I mean, I, you're a good looking guy, but mama, you ain't the only one. Yeah, you know what so, I mean? They jump into bed, you know, it, because a lot, of, a lot of people think like, oh, oh, I'm, I'm all that. No, mama, she's done that with other people, man. Yeah, man. So it's, it's a, I don't know, it's a fine, <laughs> it's a fine balance, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like, I'll be, I'll be real with you. I mean, one of the reasons why, so I'm, I'm going, I'm doing another sober year right now, and I've done it once before. Um, I like alcohol. I'm not going to lie. I'm, flipping. I'm just, I like alcohol. It's funny because I just started drinking. Really? I just picked it up as a hobby. No, like, no, you know, I never used to drink. Right. But now, like, I have a glass of wine here and there. Yeah. You know, usually before I was drinking, I was like two or three times a year. Yeah. But now it's maybe a couple of times a week, you, right. know, with, you know, with dinner, I have a glass of wine, right. and all that kind of stuff. Bro. And, I, and, and, I tell, and, I, and I tell my wife, it's because our little son, man, she cry, he cries too much. I need something to cope with. Yeah, man. It's like, <laughs> I like alcohol, man. I've, I've always, I've never done it. I've never, I've never gone out and been like, yo, we're going to get fucked up tonight. I want to, like, I, I enjoy sitting down, having a glass of scotch, smoking a cigar, yeah. chilling out. I like having drinks with friends, you know, it loosens me up yeah. a little bit. I, you know, I think you can probably vibe with this a little bit is that obviously when you're running a business, especially when you're running when you're running, like I'm running multiple businesses and right now I'm not at a point where I really have a big team that's helping me. I mean, I'm doing a lot myself. So it's stressful. Yeah. I mean, bro, I got, I got gray in my fucking beard and I'm 26 years old. So I was like, I started checking myself a little bit last few weeks and I was like, yo, we gotta, I need to, I'm going to take another sober year. And part of it is because I don't like making influence decisions. Yeah. I like making sober decisions. Yes. Yeah. So part of it was I started realizing like, you know, I'm hanging out with some girls, I'm doing stuff that it just, it doesn't fit me. Like it doesn't fit Cody. So I'm like, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take another year because I, I truly believe you walk your talk and the, and the people that are attracted to that shit start showing up. You know, 100%, 100%, man. You know, you know it, it's, it's crazy you realize that. It's crazy at this age you realize that. You know, because if you wanna attract the right type of people in your life, yep. Then you become the right type of person. True. You can't go to a club and try to get a church girl. You feel me? You know what I'm saying? Yep. You, know, you go to the club, you're gonna get what you're gonna get. No, yep. don't don't expect a church girl to, you know, in a in a in an after hour nightclub in Hollywood. Yeah, man. You know? I freaking tell people all the time, like I see these girls on Instagram post pictures of their ass and do all this shit. And I'm like, I literally, if I don't unfollow them right then and there, I generally mute their profiles. Cause like, I'm like, the only thing I can think about is like, what the hell has gone on in your life that makes you think you got to do that? We just want attention, man. Bro, it's wild. You know, like you do it all for a heart. <laughs> you do it all for a heart. All for the gram, man. So, what's next for you? You know, you know, you have accomplished so much right now. You know, capital markets are blowing up. Yeah. You know, everybody that I talk to at your gym have the highest regards for you. You know, and everybody that I know has the highest regards for you. All the way from all the CEOs and and all the way to the trainers that, that are under you and, and work for you and everything else like that. What drives you? What motivates you? And what do you want to accomplish by the time you're 30? Because it's five years from now, by the time you're 30, I don't, I, I'm gonna be on the sideline, like, a, like, a, like cheering you on, man. Like, ah, man, it's, I told you it's gonna be a billionaire. I told you it's gonna be a billionaire. Bro. Like, like tell, me, tell, tell me your plans, bro. I wanna, I, 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 it's hard, bro. It's really, really hard. When you're, when you're, I think you can probably vouch for me on this. When you're in your 20s and you're young and, and you know that your ambition is probably greater right now than it's ever going to be in your entire life, sometimes you just put your head down and go with it. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of times people ask me, like, what, what's your vision? Where do you want to be? What do you want to accomplish? And, and it's not so much about a vision right now. It's a lot about a mission. Like, you know, I have a mission to change the way people do business. I have, a, I have a mission to change the way that people think about themselves. And one of my missions in business is that I get tired of people treating each other like shit. And they use business as the excuse to do it. Yeah. They say, oh, it's cutthroat. 
No, it's not. You're just an asshole. Yeah, exactly. Like, it doesn't need to be cutthroat. It doesn't need to be cutthroat. Yeah, like, we can win together. Yeah. Now, if you're, if you're competing against me, I'm probably going to put my foot on your throat. Yeah. But, if, you're, but if, you and, if you and I can collaborate and win together. Why not? Why not do it? Dude, I don't walk into my, my offices and treat my employees like employees. They're my family. Mm-hmm. They're, they're my people. They, they're what keep us afloat and what allow us to thrive. They're, they're more important to me than, than anything. Yeah. So I think, I think that, that's the mindset that I want to help people realize is that when you're, when you're going into something, that your business should not be separated from your life. I don't care if you're an entrepreneur. I don't care if you're working a job. You need to be aligned with wherever you go to work because you're going to spend 80, 60%, 70% of your life at work. That business Whoever the hell you report to on a daily basis, whether it's yourself or somebody else, needs to be completely aligned with, the, with what you want to accomplish in your life. Because otherwise, you are wasting your time. Mm-hmm. So my mission right now with the businesses that I'm operating and running is, is that I want to establish a culture of people. Yeah. I want to create my environment. I want to establish something of self-belief within the people that are around. In the vision, I just have realized, look, if you have the right intention and you're willing to execute on the right intention, yeah. everything will come to yeah, play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't got to worry about the money. You don't got to worry about the, you know, what you're going to have or it's where it's going to go. Together. It'll come together. It'll come together. You know, so, but the end all be all is, uh, the end all be all is to create, uh, you know, use, use these next, I got four years. I tell people all the time. I'm, I got until I'm 30. When I'm 30 years old, I will have, uh, the ability to retire if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's more about being able to establish residual sources of income and be able to do those things. Not so much that I can just say, hey, I'm gonna go sit on a boat and do what I want. It's it's so that I can truly spend 100% of my time going after impact in the world. Yeah. That's it. Brother, you know, it's, it's crazy. You know, when I sit down with someone like you at this age, and talk to you, and the whole time when I'm talking to you, it's like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, this guy ain't 25. <laughs> this guy ain't 25, because your whole mentality is just in a whole new level. Like I said, I wish I had half the mindset that you have at 25. So it's a pleasure to have you. For people who don't know you, you know, tell, me, tell them how to find you and your different businesses and everything else like that. Yeah, uh, best place to find me is Instagram. I mean. Uh, that's kind of the world of the millennials. What is your, what, what, what is your so, Instagram? So uh, Instagram is Cody C. Stevens, just at Cody, Cody C. Stevens. At, at Cody C. Stevens? Yep. And Stevens is spelled how? Uh, S-T-E-V-E-N-S. Okay. So uh, yeah, find me on Instagram. Um, company name is Gapital.inc. Find us on Instagram, find us on Facebook, same thing. Um, Gapital with a G. So Gapital Inc. And then um, you obviously, self-made training facility, Chino Hills. You guys can see that one. Uh, we've got some plans. We've got some plans to expand some self mades too. I so, you do, man. so uh, yeah. Shout out to Miguel Aguilar, man. He's a, he's, a, he's a, one of my favorite people in the world. You yeah. know, what I mean, he's he has a crazy story, as you know. Yeah. And uh, matter of fact, I'm supposed to meet up with him on Thursday. Do a do a little uh, do a little dinner. Yeah, that's uh, that's funny. I'm meeting with Miguel Thursday too. We got Miguel. That's how Miguel and I connected. Yeah. Was you know just kind of like shit. We come from the same world. Yeah. So you know different backgrounds but very yeah. very similar stories so uh yeah i really appreciate having me sam i mean it's been fun man and it's all, we, we, it's guys, all we gotta have you back absolutely brother thanks cody appreciate thanks, you bro. Thanks for coming over